You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello out there in uh, archaeology podcast land. This is Dr. Alan Garfinkel. I'm the president and founder of the California Rock Art Foundation. And what we do is we identify, evaluate, manage, and conserve rock art both in Alta, California and in Baja, California. We conduct field trips. We have trainings, exercise. We do research. And in every way possible, we try to preserve, protect, and coordinate treasures of Alta and Baja California rock art, of which there are many and diverse. We also work closely with Native Americans and uh, partner with them to recognize and protect sacred sites. So for more info about the fabulous California Rock Art Foundation, you can go to carockart.org. Also, I'm I'm open to give me a call, 805-312-2261. We would uh, welcome sponsorship or underwriting, uh, helping us to defray the costs of our podcasts. And also membership in California Rock Art Foundation. And of course, donations since we are a 501c3 nonprofit scientific and educational corporation. God bless everyone out there in podcast land. You're listening to the Rock Art Podcast. Join us every week for fascinating tales of rock art, adventure, and archaeology. Find our contact info in the show notes and send us your suggestions. Hello out there in archaeology podcast land. This is your host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel, introducing episode 77. And we're going to be hearing from Noel Hidalgo Tan from Bangkok in Southeast Asia. Can you imagine? And we're going to be talking about a world-class platform to learn a bit more about the global vision of rock art scholars all over the world. Now, this is really one you don't want to miss. Hello out there in archaeology podcast land. This is your host, Dr. Alan Garfinkel. We're going to hear from Noel, who's a professor and a remarkable researcher who does work in Southeast Asia. And he, uh, in fact, does specialize in rock art. And he, he graced our presence just a few months ago. And in fact, the reason I've asked him back is he wants to promote and publicize and talk about quite a remarkable platform that he's going to be initiating. It'll be an online course in world rock art. Is that right, Noel? Do I have it right? Yeah, well, almost. I'm not a professor. Okay. I, I don't teach. Technically, my my designation is the senior specialist in archaeology, okay. which is a, a very long and roundabout way of, of saying, well, yeah, everything that has to do with archaeology is under my purview. Uh, yes. in my organization and the organization well so the last time I was talking to you I, I had hinted at the idea that I was going to launch a course on uh, rock art an online course which is why I'm here today to, to tell you and tell everyone about it I think you have a few participants don't you signed up yeah, we just crossed 100 participants yesterday. Oh, my word. Wow. Uh, I'm hoping to get a lot more because we can we can support up to 1,000. So I believe believe you me, that's 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 amazing. For for an initial course that hasn't been offered to have 100 people online to to listen to about world rock art, Noel, that is absolutely fabulous. Yeah, so I'm I'm quite excited. I'm quite I'm quite happy with the 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 stuff that we're putting out together. So the the course is called Rock Art in Southeast Asia and the World. And I, I'll need to back up a bit because first of all, I work for the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts. So it's a mouthful, and that's quite quite a mouthful, I would say. Regionally, we're, we're known as SPAFA for short. Uh, that's that's also another story, but so, well, when we first started out, we were called the Special Project in Archaeology and Fine Arts, so it was SPAFA. And then uh, a, a few years later, we got upgraded into a center. So now we're the regional center, but then the name SPAFA stuck, and it's easy to say. So we've been SPAFA for 50 years. Uh, that's that's uh, that's where we are. So we've been... You know, we've been affected by COVID like many people. We used to we used to have international meetings, travel around, uh, organize workshops for archaeologists and other professionals and cultural heritage in the region. Uh, because of COVID, we couldn't do any of that. 
And so last year, was it last year already? Yeah, last year, we changed one of our, our programs. We had planned to do a intensive field course on bones conservation in Thailand two years ago. We couldn't do it because of COVID. So last year, we, we changed that field course into an online course, which was, I think, pretty pretty successful. We, we had a bunch of regional experts divide out topics, and then we, we had these, uh, this two-month course where people could learn about different aspects of bone conservation in Southeast Asia. Now, tell me, tell me how that was done. When you, when you say it's an online course, is, is it video? Is it, is it Zoom? Is it, is it audio? How does that, how does that work? So we have, we have like say, uh, six weeks of, of lectures. It's designed to be asynchronous. So, you know, being the the audience being as wide as it is, we decided that we didn't want to have live lectures because they would tie everybody down into specific times and places. So at the start of every week, we would launch, we would have these pre-recorded videos, pre-recorded lectures. They would, they would go live, uh, say, on Monday. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the participants could follow them at their own time. Mm-hmm. And then each lecture was accompanied by supplementary readings. People could read them or not read them if they, if they wish. We, we did find that most people read them, surprisingly. And then uh, a short quiz to, to just test that you, you know, actually were listening to the lectures. And how long was each lecture? Well, we asked we asked our lecturers to keep them short because this okay. is the internet age. Yes. So we we averaged around twenty to thirty minute okay. lectures. So little modules, got it. Yeah. And and I think that, that worked really well because I, I think it was really hard for our lecturers to, to conduct you know, we're we're used to doing lectures for like one hour long. Uh, and then I was telling everyone to give TED Talks basically. It was a challenge, but I think everyone stepped up to it really well. And it was a good, it was good training for everyone. You know, everyone was starting to get online and starting to, to get used to the, to the format, to the medium as well. Mm-hmm. And the participants responded really well to it because they could follow it at their own time. A lot of them, a lot of them would like do the lectures during the lunch break or do one in the evening and they could, they could space it out throughout the week. Then they can access it at their convenience. Yes, which was which is a really important. We, we built that in uh, at the very beginning. We knew, we knew we wanted to build a course where participants could access it at their own time. The The only drawback that we had from this was that uh, at the end, a lot of, uh, some of our participants said, well, we wish we had, we had time to interact with the lecturers. Which we, you know, because of the nature of the of the pre recorded uh, courses, we we couldn't build it to. So so well, we've we've taken a lot of the positives from the last course into this into this rocket course too. So we have even we've we've crammed in even more lectures from the last time. Last the last time we had like twelve for the bones course for the Southeast Asian course. The the rock uh-huh. art course we have like twenty one now, which is like twenty one lectures. Twenty one wow. lectures. We're gonna we're gonna be focusing on different parts of the world for each week, and then also focusing on one specific region in Southeast Asia because we do want to promote Southeast Asian rock art, Southeast Asian archaeology as a as a region, and also to 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 let let people know that hey, so you know you you have this survey of of rock art around the world, but we do want to emphasize that Southeast Asia, which is not a, a region that you traditionally think about in terms of rock art, that it is an area rich in rock art. Fantastic. So it's going to showcase the Southeast Asian rock art, but also have a quite a diversity of other areas, I guess, geographies. Yeah. Yes, we have essentially every, every part of the world covered. We have lectures from the Americas. We have from uh, Europe, Africa, Greater Asia, Oceania, and Southeast Asia, so that you know, you you do get a a, a world a, a whirlwind tour of the world rock art scene. That's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. What made you think of doing this uh, online or developing? I don't think this has been done before, has it? No, I don't think so too. I mean, I mean, I'm I I'm sure there are, and I, I think I've seen a few. I mean, I I definitely took a, an undergraduate course in world rock art, but it's always given by mm-hmm. you know one person. So this is the this it's is the a first live time. Yeah, it's a live lecture. 
this is the first time that you'll have a world rock art course where all the all the lecturers, all the instructors, are the experts from their part part of the world. So it's like you know you, you get to you're going to hear about the the Paleolithic rock art of Europe from Jean Michel Chenest, who is the who was the director of the French prehistoric uh, organization, uh, the National Prehistory Center, and who was in you know if you go to Lascaux and Chauvet, his face is all over the displays. Fabulous. We have the director of the Altamira Museum. Right. For the for for our people that that may not know, and I know a tiny bit because I happen to have uh, attended the. And in New Mexico, the International Federation of Rock Art Organizations, IFRAO, and I met some of the Altamira people that were working on that. So if you have a, a thumbnail sketch to just tell people about what, what happened and what's being done in Altamira right now, I understand that they've, they've replicated the cave and now it's open for visitation vis-a-vis the replica Am I correct? Yeah. I, in fact, I was in Altamira three years ago. Oh, really? And it's wonderful. I mean, we we went to the we went to Altamira, we went to Lasco and Chauvet, and and there they they've built these because you can't go into the actual caves because because it disrupts the the natural. But the replicas are really one to one replicas in in some. Some moments you actually forget that you're in a building, and you 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 feel like you're in actual an actual cave. It's it's amazing. It's like that's that's how you do a replica, right? So it's the sounds, it's the sense, it's the it's the 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 feeling, the temperature, the whole look of the cave, the lights, the everything is 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 just a, it's a doppelganger for the the actual cave itself. Yeah, you enter. You enter the. You enter the 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 doors. The doors close behind you, and then and then you're just in pitch darkness. And then the the you know the lights do do the magic for you. And, and in fact, the 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 magic doesn't lift. Like for the entire time that you're in the building, you don't you don't feel as if you're in a building. Wow, that's amazing. And and I remember we were in one of the one of the the northern Spain. So Altamira is just one 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 side of the of the Paleolithic art of uh, Spain because they've they've added more into the UNESCO mm-hmm. list. But we were in one site again, uh, where we had the whole site to ourselves, the whole the whole building to ourselves. So we were exploring all the all the different caves, going through the wa- uh, walkways. But you only you only realize that it's not real when when we were leaving the building and then they turned on all the lights and then you just saw, you know, you just saw the, the screens. You saw, you saw, you saw the fiberglass cave settings and you saw the, the frames and the outside of the thing, things that you don't see when you're in the, the display and then, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute. What was the most impressive thing that you went through when you, when you traveled through Altamira or Lascaux or Chauvet? And these were all, of course, replicas, I presume. Do they, do they have replicas for all three? Yes, they have replicas for all three. So what's really what's really impressive is that, and you know, they, they always touch on this in the books, but you don't you don't really understand it until you see it. They they talk about how uh, the painters use the contours of the rock to emphasize dimensionality. So like especially the bison uh, of Altamira, they they're large and they they're muscular, and you don't see that until you see the real thing, or at least a replica. Did use the curvature of the rock, right? And so, when you say see the real thing, it's the dimensions and the morphology and the actual being there physically that I must I must touch must touch you physiologically to sort of see that and sense it. Correct? Yeah, and then and then and then because that you know you you usually read this in, in books and the, and books are inherently two dimensional right right and you don't you don't get it until you you've seen you've seen a three dimensional depiction of the of the rock art and then like oh okay i get it now like like how the how the 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 bison seems to move when you walk around the boulder and how and how just did they do something with the flickering light so like a fire or some sort of a torch when one held a torch there was there was suggestions that it almost looks like there's movement 
Yeah, they did. So uh, I remember in yeah in Chauvet they they had the 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 panel with the the lion I, I believe, and yes they 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 have I think they have it uh they have it going on every every fifteen minutes or so. But every fifteen minutes uh-huh. the the lights will will dim, and then you will you know because you can control the the lighting it simulates uh, firelight, and you get to see how how the panel would have looked like. Uh, in complete darkness in, in when you're holding a torch. Well, let's hold that thought while we hold our torch and pick it up on the next segment. See you uh, shortly, gang, on the flip-flop. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out an introduction to paleoradiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Register of Professional Archaeologists and the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on Pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P A L E O imaging.com and check out the link in the show notes. Hello, out there. We're up to the second segment of Rock Art, episode 77, with uh, Noel Hidago Tan, who is from Southeast Asia. He's coming in from that part of the universe, and in turn, we're interviewing him and talking about a worldwide rock art class that's going to be uh, developed and available for you to participate in. So a rock art class worldwide, can you give us sort of an inventory of, you said there's about 20 or 21 different purveyors of rock art geographically. Can you give us a rundown of, of some of the, the luminaries and, and part of the geographies of where you've gotten people. Yeah, in fact, before before we started this call, I was I was doing some of the the work on the back end with with this course because I I'm you know we're setting up the course right now as we speak. So let's see, we have from from Europe we have the rock art of Altamira, uh, the Paleolithic rock art of of Europe, Jean Michel Jeunesse and Pilar Fatas, uh, George Nash, Aaron Mazel. We'll be talk, uh, the, the last two will be talking about, well, the last one, Aaron's going to be talking about the rock art of Northern England. England, okay. Northern England, okay. So, it, so some of these things are very geographically specific. They're not broad treatments, but they're, they're almost microscopic in the sense that they're narrow casting on their, on their research interests. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so you're, you're, kind, you're kind of getting a, you know, a showcase or a deep dive into the mysteries of someone's research, aren't you? Yeah, kind of is. We we um to give you some more examples, we have we have Salima Professor Salima Ikram. She's going to talk about us about Egyptian rock art, which is, you never hear about Egyptian rock art. Egyptian rock art, never, never. Maria Isabel um, from Argentina is going to talk about the the rock art of the Southern Andes. So you know, not just the Andes, but the Southern Andes. And then from Southeast Asia, we have we have talks about the rock art of the Philippines, the rock art of East Timor, the rock art of Peninsula Malaysia, the rock art of Thailand. We have talks about the rock art of Southern China, rock art of India, the rock art of Oceania. Wow, it is it is a wide survey. It is, uh, and, and they do vary in terms of of granularity. But I, I think I think taken as a whole, you do get a a, a nice sense of. Which is what we intended. Yeah, you get a, a sense of, of everything out there. So you have old world and new world rock art, I presume. Yep. And the new world rock art is represented in any any other geographies besides the one that you mentioned. Uh, no, not that I can think of. Okay, but you have South America, correct? We have South America. Yes. Yes. So uh, interesting, interesting, very interesting. Yeah. So we have one from North America and one from South America. And and who's who's in North America? Who's going to re- be represented? Yanni Lupso is going to talk about the rock out of uh, southeastern United States. Okay. And what part of the U.S. is uh, he going to uh, chat about? In the region of Georgia. Georgia and surrounding states. Yeah. And and you know what? I know nothing about that. Absolutely, <laughs> I even, didn't even real, didn't even realize that there's rock art in Georgia. You and me both. You know, 
I mean, if I, I thought you were going to see the American Southwest, the Great Basin, you know, uh, Pecos tradition in South, you know, something that I knew something about. Never heard a, a word about Georgia. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, you know, that's the great thing about this course. I, I think there is literally something you will come away learning something from, even if you know some a little bit about rock art in your part of the world. I don't think you know yeah. about rock art about, you know, these parts of the world too. No, no. I mean, that's that's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Oh, of course. And I forget, we have the rock out of Australia because these are, you know, I, oh, I yes, in yes, Australia yes. and and we uh -huh. have really good stuff from, from Australia too. How do I, I would be remiss by not mentioning that. Is that going to be represented by you or someone else? No, um, I, I have uh, Paul Tayson, who is my, my uh, oh, former yes, supervisor, yes. Uh, and Joe McDonald. Oh, yeah. So someone oh, from Joe, the East course, Coast and someone yeah. from the West Coast too. Yes, and the West Coast. So, yeah, I, I met Joe, I think a couple of times. She, uh, I know she teaches, you know, both in Australia, but also at the University of California, Berkeley, I believe. And mm -hmm. one of the, my board members from the California Rock Art Foundation did her PhD on rock art. Her name is Donna Gillette. She's been very busy with the American Rock Art Research Association. But her research is uh, throughout California, mainly on the coastal areas. And it's about what she calls PCNs or these, um, I don't even know what it stands for, but it's the, it's these cupule boulder petroglyphs that are embedded with these uh, rather unusual convex and concave elements to them. And they're found only in certain lithologies, like in serpentine or in steatite boulders. Mm. Amazing. And they're literally, they're literally from the Northern edge of California, a little tipping over into Oregon, all the way down into just the Northern tip of the Baja Peninsula. And they mainly occur along the coast and they appear to be very, very, very ancient. There's a uh, you know, discussions that they uh, came in with what they call the Hokan people, the, you know, the people that were some of the, the first in migration or, Realm, you know, realm into California, but so that was uh, her her dissertation research, and no no one had really done any work on this class of rock art sites, so she pioneered some certain yeah. interesting. So that's work. that's really interesting because it you know as a region, I, I consider myself a, a regionalist, particular to Southeast Asia. So I I I I always thought of myself as, oh yeah, I've, I've had a really good sense of the diversity of, of rock art, at least, at least in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. But in putting right. this course together, and then you realize, oh, actually, no, I know nothing about the diversity of rock art because that, <laughs> it's a lot more diverse than I thought, and which, which is really humbling right, right. in a way. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm glad yeah, to be able to, to convey that in a course. Yes, yes. And I think it's, it's almost as though you know, I, I say I've said this before, but when you think about that, you know something about a subject, right? Like, for instance, I had been studying the uh, prehistory, the anthropology, the archaeology of Eastern California for most of my adult life. Let's say at least four, at least forty years. How's that? And then I meet up with a group of Native Americans and publish a book on the uh, anthropology, ethnology rock art, basketry, language of these uh, native people, including their sacred narrative. And I learned more in four years than I learned in 40 years, just because you're, you're working with the no. people themselves. Have you run across anything like that? Yeah, just by putting this course together, I've, I've learned so much about rock art that, that's challenging. You know, it's uh, not challenging, but reminding me about that I... I there is much more to know than beyond my own framework. What's the the sort of the greatest takeaway that you have from from sort of to do this yourself, besides the diversity of rock art and the diversity of sort of rock art specializations? What what's the thread that ties us together, if anything, when we think of rock art scholars? Why do why do people get get enmeshed and obsessed with rock art? Obsessed is a good word. I I. I don't know if you noticed this too, but there is something about rock art that that is so accessible that it it almost turns people crazy for rock art. 
right? It always turns people crazy. Okay. The, 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 you know, it, it really, it really sparks imagination and it really, yes, it does. Gets people, you know, I, 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 we as an academic, as academics, we are only just one uh, kind of rock art enthusiast. There are many yes. more, other, uh, there are many other kinds of rock art enthusiasts. Some certainly more more unusual than than us academic types. Oh yeah, there's those that are artists, of course, right? The artist yep. side that appreciates it. There's people that are obsessed with the acoustics of rock art and the sounds. And then the the tourists, the the people who want to go to every rock yes, art site tourists, out there. Yes, right, right. They want to they want to check off all the boxes. There's you know the avocationalist that just loves the aura and the cultural associations of rock art. The California Rock Art Foundation just did four trips, cultural tours to the great mural rock art of Baja, California, believe it or not. And they were all filled. I guess it was all post COVID. Everybody wanted to go there, but to get there talk about it, they wanted to go, it has to be an adventure. So we went to this area, Sierra de San Francisco, where there's no roads, of course, and the trails, that are there are only manageable on the backs of mules. And then on the backs of mules, then your gear is moved on burrows and you have the vaqueros that help you to navigate and those that are experts in this area to keep you safe and on the trail and not down the drainage in the, uh, the Grand Canyon of Mexico. So you can imagine this is where we have those murals that are larger than life, some of the largest prehistoric paintings in the world. They call the uh, Great Mural Rock Art of Baja, California. Mm. So, but the reason, I, the reason I bring that up is when the people came back, they told me they were very, you know, enamored with the rock art, certainly, and the vistas. But one of their favorite things about the whole tour was the culture of the people who are associated with that part of the world. It was such a uh, challenging environment, such a deficient environment, and so natural and unimpaired that there was some sort of a, a flavor or a connection with the local ecology and the local people that just permeated their whole experience. And they found that to be one of the more wondrous aspects of participating in rock art adventures. I think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, certainly there's a, a large degree of enthusiasm. Yeah, they, they, they go there for the adventure, the epic quality, the place that they get to see, the, um, the circumstances, the ecology, the landforms, the vistas, the adventure. That's what I'm searching, the adventure. So that's our second segment. <laughs> on, on the third go around, let's... Uh, Let's move a little closer to the um, dealing with some of the details of the of the course and what one might uh, want to know about it and how to access it. Yeah. See you in the flip flop, gang. Here we go, gang. Rock Art seventy seven with Noel and the course of world rock art out of Southeast Asia and all around the globe. Noel, take it away. Where does this? How can they get more information on this course? First of all. Cool. Uh, so information on the course can be found on our website. It's www.semeo, S-E-A-M-E-O, dash spafa, S-P-A-F-A, uh, slash rock art. And if I was going to Google the course, what's it, call what's it called? Uh, rock art in Southeast Asia and the world. Okay. And I also have a link on my, on my, my personal website. So uh, Southeast Asian please, Archaeology... Please dot com slash rock art. Okay. And when does it get started? When does so it, it starts unveil? on 2nd of May. It'll run all the way to 24th of June. So there'll be seven weeks of, uh, of lectures. Every uh, new lectures come up every Monday, uh, about three or four of them every week. And then you can follow them in your own time. The, most of the lectures are around half an hour long. Some of them are, are longer, but not, not, not most of them. You follow lectures, you can do the readings if you want, and then do a small quiz at the end. 
in between the in between the courses in between the lectures we also have uh, virtual site visits so we have a virtual site visit to the Shauve caves we have a virtual site visit to Gua Tambun in Malaysia which is one of the sites that I worked on in in my MA work and then uh, next next week I'm I'm uh, going out of Bangkok we're going to film a virtual site visit in a place called Saraburi it's a there's a rock outside in a in a in a province near near Bangkok where you have a Buddhist temple but there's also rock art in the in in the Buddhist temple too gotcha so when they uh, sign up for this is there a cost yes so the course is about Thirty dollars, thirty US dollars. It's not terribly expensive, but I think it's no. uh, well well worth for what for what you're getting. You're getting you're getting to learn about rock art from around the world, from the very experts from that part of the world. Is the course associated with any sort of academic institution so they can get course credit, or is this considered to be something independent of that? So the course is is more general than academic, but okay. CMEO, the the uh, SPAFA, the the center that I work for, we are a training yes. institution. We we there is a certificate at the end of the course, and in fact, we okay. we, we have two levels of certification. We have just you know just the generic cert- certificate of participation, but mm-hmm. if you do want to get a, a a certificate of completion, you do have to finish all the quizzes to show that you have understood the, the courses. In the past, we have used the two levels of, of, so like for the bones course that we first did, you you have to get the certificate of completion in order to join our physical workshops in the future. Oh, I see. Okay. So the two levels of courses, uh, two levels of, of sort of finishing this. Additionally, so you said there's about 21 different uh sort of modules or lectures am i correct something like that yes yes yeah. 21ish and so there are, are there multiple per week yes you, you get about maybe 3 or 4 a week i see okay and how many of these would they would one have to attend to to be to be considered that they completed the course all of them you have to finish all the quizzes <laughs> <laughs> all right gotcha so it's a rigorous course with an important level of completion. You know, you're gonna have to work for that certificate of completion. Gotcha. But if you're if you're gonna if you wanna be a tourist, you can you can just be a tourist. You can come in yeah, and sure. uh, you know so that means, yeah. We've designed a course so that you know if you if you wanna take it seriously, you can. If you wanna just come by, listen to the lectures, you also can. Great, great. And the way these are set up. We can access them basically anytime, even after that week is over. I could go back and pick up the ones I missed. Yeah, am I correct? There, no? there will be okay. there will be a, a few live events which we're still trying oh, to, okay. to arrange. So, you know, like, like I said, the the last time round, people really missed interacting with the with the with the yeah. lecturers. Yeah. So we, uh-huh. we are we are trying to to tie in uh, two or three live question and answer sessions. So like a Q Q and A. Yeah. It's a lot harder than it looks because everyone's from different time zones. So, and will that be a, a that has to be live? And that has to be live. And as, will it be visual as well as auditory or no? Yes, it will be like a, a webinar, so like a Zoom meeting or a, or a ah, Google. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, how how cool is that? I love it. So that's that's something that that uh, I think I think people missed from the last time. So we really want to put that in. Well, this is a tremendous amount of work you're putting into this. <laughs> it is. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about this more and more, and I'm going, "Oh my word, what a what an effort to uh, really convene such a complex platform, and probably to to get all of these individuals signed up and committed, and and to get the material available on a singular platform to present this kind of complex, multifaceted, worldwide." series of lectures i'm impressed needless yeah, to say yeah i i think there's there's also you know certainly time and place has to do with it i i don't think there's any there i don't think there are many organizations around the world that can that can do something like this so i because i'm not i'm not a pure academic and i belong to a regional training center so that that right. uh, allows me this opportunity to convene a course like this because we already do regional trainings 
So you have the sophistication, you've got the platforms, you've got the technology at your fingertips where other other places couldn't couldn't do this. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, and of course, you know, us coming out of COVID where where we've we've come through this two or three years of just hellish being unable to do anything in person. So we were were well poised to you know, it was the right time and place to do something like this. Well, I'm 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 impressed. What else should I ask you to uh, assist you in sort of coming uh, together and and uh, capturing the uh, imagination and interest in our audience? Well, you know, to 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 you who's listening to this, I hope this course sounds like something you might be interested in, and I hope to to see you there. I hope you can join us, or you know, tell your friends because I I really am really proud about the the course that we've put together. And I really want to get this word out to everyone. Is, is there some sort of a, an overview, a visual overview of what you've got going on your website or on a platform that when I go there to the website, I can see the various people and presentations? Have you gotten that far? Yes. Yes. So the course website has has all the information that you have. So it has the the outline of the the, the course outline. It has uh, profiles of all the speakers. It has information oh, of how you join. Everything is done through Google Classroom. That's that's okay. the easiest way that we've been able to do it. Is that a user friendly platform? It it is. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone's had, had difficulties with it. You know, invariably, I always find you know the the, the launch days are the, the hardest. But yeah. I've, we've done this once before, so I think we've done most of the mistakes the last time around. Well, that's good. That's very exciting. Well, I'm, I'm certainly uh, interested in, in attending both as a student and perhaps even a presenter. And it's rather exciting to know more about this. I was interested when I first heard about it. And I thought of you again when we, uh, you know, sort of entertained the notion to be interact and knew that this was going to be coming up shortly. Yeah, thanks for having me and thanks thanks for uh, uh, allowing me this opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, and I'd recommend it to our listeners who want to learn something about rock art on a much more broader scale than anything I'm able to produce in a uh, one hour, you know, capture from a singular individual. So I'll add some links to the show notes, I, I suppose, to, to direct you to where to go for this course. A- absolutely. And, and as I get uh, people that are interested in sending me email, I'm going to forward it to you and see if we can get them signed up. But sounds like the investment of $30 is, is the biggest bargain this side of the Pecos. Yeah, we, we, we didn't price it to, we're not making a profit out of this. That's really the other thing. I, I, no, I don't think so. <laughs> well, God bless you. That's it for now. See you next week, gang. Thanks. Bye. See you on the flip flop. Thanks for listening to the Rock Art Podcast with Dr. Alan Garfinkel and Chris Webster. Find show notes and contact information at www.arcpodnet.com forward slash rock art. Thanks for listening and thanks for sharing this podcast with your family and friends. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, Dig Tech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.